right now you are on my YouTube channel. I could open a YouTube channel because these three guys created it back in 2005. But they could do it because of the internet. And the internet was invented by Robert E. Kahn and Vince Cerf. We can literally keep going back like this. My point here is this. Just look at how many inventors and inventions had to come together to make this moment of interaction between you and me possible. All of our inventions are interdependent. Using the internet is impossible without having a satellite in space. But to send satellites, we need a rocket. And the story of launching the first rocket into space is fascinating. Today we can launch a space mission because in the 90th century a poor scientist from Russia devoted his entire life to rocket science and also because of Adolf Hitler's actions during World War II. Today we are dreaming about colonizing Mars and becoming a multi-planetary species only because of the hard work of these three guys. Without them it would have been impossible to even think about sending a satellite to space. In the modern era, those who work in spaceflight today often acknowledge the three fathers of rocketry who helped push the first rocket into space. Only one of these three survived long enough to see rockets being used for space exploration. The poor visionary. Decades before the invention of car, the Russian visionary Konstantin Tsiolkovsky was busy forming the theoretical basis for space travel. Tsiolkovsky lived most of his life in poverty and isolation. As a youth, he spent most of his life in the library, reading science journals, learning Newton's laws of motion, and applying them to space travel. In the era when people were using horse carts for city-to-city -city travel, Tsiolkovsky was dreaming about traveling to the moon and Mars. Without any help from the scientific community, he figured out the mathematics, physics, and mechanics of rockets. He also calculated the escape velocity of the Earth, which is the speed necessary for a rocket to escape the gravity of Earth. In 1903, he published his famous rocket equation which allows one to determine the maximum velocity of a rocket when given its weight and fuel supply. The equation revealed that the relationship between speed and fuel is exponential. Normally, one might assume that if you want to double the rocket's velocity, you simply need to double the amount of fuel. But instead, the amount of fuel you need rises exponentially with the change in velocity. Tsiolkovsky's equation made it clear that the rocket needs enormous amounts of fuel to leave the earth and to get an extra boost in speed. Without caring about the people who made fun of him and his poor economic condition, he kept working tirelessly. Tsiolkovsky's guiding philosophy was, The earth is the cradle of humanity, but mankind cannot stay in the cradle forever. Our planet is too small for such a multitude of emotions and sensations that we are experiencing. Man must explore this outer space where life can spread out and flourish. The earth is a launching pad. We must leave it and turn our eyes to the stars. Tsiolkovsky was too poor to convert his mathematical equations into actual models, but his equation helped next generation scientists like Robert Goddard who actually built prototypes. Robert Goddard first became interested in science as a child when he witnessed the electrification of his hometown. First he began experimenting with kites and balloons, then Goddard effectively figured out ways to apply Newton's laws to rocketry. He invented usable scientific tools by introducing three innovations. First, Goddard experimented with different types of fuels and realized that powdered fuel is insufficient. The Chinese had invented gunpowder centuries earlier and used it for rockets, but gunpowder burns unevenly and hence rockets remain a mere toy for centuries. Goddard's first innovative idea was to replace powdered fuel with liquid fuel because liquid fuel can be precisely controlled. He built a rocket with two tanks. One tank contained a fuel such as alcohol and the other tank contained an oxidizer such as liquid oxygen. Goddard realized that as the rocket rose into the sky, its fuel gradually decreased. So his next innovation was to introduce multi-stage rockets that could get rid of the empty fuel tanks and therefore could lose some weight along the way. This increased the rocket's range and efficiency. His third innovation was the gyroscope. It is a device used for measuring or maintaining orientation and angular velocity. Goddard realized that he could use gyroscope to keep his rockets on target. In 1926, he made history with the first successful launch of a liquid fuel rocket. It rose 41 feet into the air, stayed in the air just for 2.5 seconds and landed 184 feet away in the cabbage pitch. Despite his success, Goddard's colleagues and many prominent media outlets made fun of him. When scientific community and media found out that Robert Goddard was giving serious thought to space travel, the New York Times published an article that mocked and questioned Robert Goddard's knowledge about rocketry. 
In 1930s, there was a misconception that rockets will not be able to move in the vacuum of outer space. However, Newton's third law, which states every action has an equal and opposite reaction, very much applies to space travel. In a rocket, the action is the hot gas ejected out of one end, while the reaction is the forward motion of the rocket that propels it, even in the vacuum of space. Goddard died in 1945 and did not live long enough to see the apology written by the editors of the New York Times after the Apollo moon landing in 1969. Rockets for War and Peace In the first phase of rocketry, we had the dreamers like the Kowalski, who worked out the physics and mathematics of space travel. In the second phase, we had people like Robert Goddard, who actually built prototypes of these rockets. In the third phase, rocket scientists worked with the major governments during and after World War II. In this phase, rockets were first used as weapons of mass destruction and then for space exploration. Baron Werner von Braun was one of the most celebrated rocket scientists. He worked on the sketches and prototypes of his predecessors and tried to develop and perfect them. After completing his PhD, von Braun spent most of his time working for the Berlin Rocket Society an organization that used spare parts to build and test rockets. Von Braun might have become a professor of physics at some German university, but the war was in the air and all of Germany, including the universities, were being militarized. Unlike Robert Goddard, who could not convince the US military to fund his projects, Von Braun got heavy funding from the German government under Hitler. The German military wanted to use Von Braun's knowledge for building weapons of mass destruction. Under his leadership, the scribblings and sketches of the Tsiolkovsky and the prototypes of Godard became the vengeance weapon, the V-2 rocket. The V-2 set several records, shattering all past achievements in terms of speed and range for a rocket. It was the first long-range guided ballistic missile, was the first rocket to break the sound barrier, and most impressively, it was the first rocket ever to leave the boundary of the atmosphere and enter outer space. Unfortunately, this revolutionary invention was only used for terrorizing London and blowing up entire city blocks. Suddenly, it appeared as if the future of Europe and the Western civilization itself might hinge upon the work of a small isolated band of scientists led by von Braun. The Germans, defeated in World War I and restricted by the Treaty of Versailles, turned to new arms. Military rocketry experiments started as early as 1929 before Hitler's rise to power. By 1932, Walter Dornberger had gathered around him in the Army Weapons Department a specialist staff, headed by a 19-year-old prodigy, Werner von Braun, a name now famous in the unfinished narrative of space flight. While summarizing von Braun's career, comedian Maud Saal once said, I reach for the stars, but sometimes I hit London. Singer Tom Lehrer wrote, Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department. However, Germany lost World War II. Von Braun and 100 of his assistants surrendered to the Allies. World War II ended with Hitler's suicide. But what happened to those V-2 rockets that were stocked up in Germany? The Soviet Russia and the United States captured those missiles. They sent those missiles to their respective countries so that scientists can study them, reverse engineer them and build new ones. After World War II, the entire US and the Soviet Union arsenals were based on modifying the V-2 rockets. Rocketry and Superpower Rivalry One of the major goals of the both United States and the Soviet Union was to launch the first artificial satellite. The Soviets took the basic V-2 design and quickly built a series of rockets based on it. The Soviet Union outperformed the United States and became the first country to send an artificial satellite to space. Then its casing opened, the springs snapped, and the nose cone was pushed out of the way. A ball with four antennae emerged to go it alone in the darkness of space, and a radio began to send a signal back to Earth. Humanity had entered the space age. Over the 4th, 1957, and the world's press announces the miracle of the age. The Russians have successfully launched the first satellite ever to circle the Earth. And this is how Americans reacted. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. The reaction was one of astonishment and concern, for it was now known that a potential enemy was at least temporarily ahead in developing means for space travel. President Eisenhower reassures the nation that Russia's success with the first satellite does not indicate a serious lag in American rocket research. 
I promised the Secretary of the Army that we would be ready in 90 days or less. But meanwhile, far across the country at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, a sprawling 80-acre research and development complex in Pasadena, California, scientists and engineers were racing toward the same deadline. 90 days to put a satellite into orbit. In Cape Canaveral, Florida, the Army's Jupiter-C rocket is ready for America's second attempt to launch a space satellite. The hours-long countdown approaches zero. A moment of enormous tension, for every missile launching is still an experiment. Any one of tens of thousands of things can go wrong with catastrophic results. But all that can be done to assure perfection has been done. The moment is at hand, the countdown reaches zero. Some three minutes later, Explorer is in orbit, broadcasting to the world its coded scientific data. This close-up of the United States edition of Sputnik was made at a press conference with leaders of the scientific teams. Dr. Verna von Braun, Dr. James Van Allen, and Dr. William Pickering. A three-way collaboration between private industry, academic science, and the military. Cosmic ray intensity, meteor impact, solar radiation. These are the dry facts that will help carry man ever farther into the age of space. Since then, we have sent more than 8,000 satellites to space. Scientists of the 21st century are talking about making humans a multi-planetary species, establishing a permanent moon base, colonizing Mars and mining the moon. But without the Silkowski, Robert Goddard and Von Braun, we could not have achieved this feat. Only one of them stayed alive to see the dream of reaching space being fulfilled. The other two, however, died decades before seeing how their work helped us in reaching the space. The Tsiolkovsky and Robert Goddard never received the respect or acknowledgement they deserved while alive. Still, they kept working and bestowed their work upon the next generation. They both died but their work stayed alive and inspired generations of rocket scientists. How great was the Great British Empire? British researcher Stephen Lascombe calculates, From London, the British ruled about 20% of the world's population, governed nearly 25% of the world's land mass, and used to represent 35% of the total global GDP. It was that great. What went wrong? To know the reasons behind the fall of the British Empire, watch my documentary on World Wars and the Fall of the British Empire.